We are at Switzerland's second largest glacier system called Gorna Gletscher. It's uh, a glacier that produces ice very high, right there next to the peak that we see over there, which is uh, the highest peak in Switzerland called the Dufourspitze. This picture is quite nice um, because it shows you a before-after image. This is from the 1870s, so about when the Little Ice Age was was ending, so really the uh, the last extent from where we see all these lateral moraines. Uh, this is in 2006 and uh, you see right now how it is in 2019. So you can see that uh, 150 years ago where we were uh, there was ice flowing down right here from the from the central glacier, the Monte Rosa glacier, um, and uh, it was still attached to the glacier down there. Uh, what we studied here in particular was the drainage of an ice marginal lake. Uh, this is a typical phenomenon which you basically have everywhere in the world where you have glaciers uh, that melt. And um, the problem is that you have a water body which is at least partially damped by uh, an ice body and these, these ice dams are inherently unstable. Ice is not a very reliable damming material and so regularly these these lakes outburst they fi find a way through the ice or they can break the ice dam and they produce uh, floods in downstream communities so the name is Jokal Halop which is Jokal Halop which is the Icelandic it's an Icelandic term Jokal you, you may have heard this that's glacier like Eyjafjallajökull, Jokal the volcano the uh, and Halop and you actually, it's a, you have an L, an H, and an L. And an Icelandic person once told me you pronounce every single letter. So you really do say Jokal Halop. And the Halop means sprint. Yeah. So it means gl it's glacial sprint. Horse. And you can see the evolution of these lake basins right here. So we're standing somewhere right here. This is the glacier over there. And you can see how as the glacier surface was lowering, you were starting to get this depression right here which was then filled with the lake water. And these lakes start draining when the lake water is capable of accessing the subglacial drainage system. So you can imagine below these ice tongues in the summer you have very large channels. They can be two meters in diameter and these channels are very efficient. So as soon as water or lake water is pressed through them they also widen because as water flows along the ice walls, uh, there's friction that's dissipated uh, and this friction increases the diameters very rapidly. Flow of water through ice wall channels is actually a very interesting problem. The hydraulic engineers, they're familiar with water flow through pipes, but they usually calculate water flow through metal pipes or concrete pipes, which don't erode. For glaciers, you have the interesting case where the water it's the same material as the channel walls. It's just the solid state. But, of course, what can happen is the water can melt the pipe, make it bigger, and this melt water contributes then to the flux. It can also freeze to the walls, which makes the, the walls shrink. So it's actually a, a quite mathematical pro problem. But <clears throat> the glacier doesn't always do the textbook example. Of course, you can also have a lot of times crevasses, um, which somehow route the water and glacially. Uh, to a moulin, which you see right here, and then to the subglacial drainage system. And what you can also have, and this is what everybody is afraid of, is if you have lots of crevasses right here, and this entire part starts floating up, so you have an iceberg calving event, and this is a matter of seconds or a minute, and then all of a sudden you have a huge connection. And this, these are the most dangerous uh, drainages that happen in the valley next door. In the 1960s, there was a glacier um, in a steep topography step, just like this one right here. And uh, there was a construction site underneath the glacier. And then uh, all of a sudden, the tongue collapsed. Uh, it ca killed 88 construction workers, which were completely surprised. A lot of research was uh, initiated, of course, to understand this event. And, and it was noticed that it's not uncommon even for steep glaciers to speed up when there's a lot of melt. But if the drainage system is unfavorable, when it cannot evacuate enough melt, then too much pressure builds up and the whole thing goes. 
In general, you see the glaciers are receding in Switzerland. Um, the parts of the glacier that gain mass are smaller and smaller, and the parts uh, of the glacier that melt uh, over average over a year are bigger and bigger. This plot, which is the mass balance in the winter, so how much mass is gained, the mass balance in the summer, which is red, and the whole, the, the, the whole balance, so one minus the other. You can also see that it's been the annual mass balance here, the green bars, they're con consistently negative uh, for almost all years. But we, what you can also see, it's really the summer balance, the negative summer balance that's picking up right here. It's not that the glaciers don't get as much mass in the winter anymore. Here in the Alps, it's really the summers that really hit the glaciers. This is really what kind of the daily bread of glaciology. You take a pole and you drill it into the ice, maybe 10 centimeters or a bit more. And then you can come back regularly and see where the ice surface is. So when you drilled it in, for example, the ice surface was here. Then you come back two weeks later, the ice surface is here and so on. Then you come back in the winter, the snow first surface is up here. And this is what glaciologists use to, uh, to, to measure the specific mass balance. So the mass balance that's very specific to a, a certain location. And then you produce these plots you have the accumulation in the dotted line right here, which in the winter uh, increases rapidly. You get lots and lots of snow. And then in the summer, you stop or you get very, li very little snow. At the same time, you get almost no melt in the winter. And then towards the spring, the melt picks up right here. And then once we get into fall, the melt slows down again. And the balance, the entire balance is simply the algebraic sum of the two, which is the solid line right here. So if you look at the solid line, this right here is the total ablation, the mass loss. This is the total accumulation, the mass gain. Then you know where you are on the glacier. Does anyone, can anyone say? Are you in the ablation zone or the accumulation zone? <coughs> ablation, no, sorry, that's accumulation. Yes, because you have a positive yeah. mass balance at the end of the year, so you're in the accumulation zone. Uh, there, there are several concerns. One is that um, the glaciers are really helping us these days because when we have a very dry and hot period in the summer without uh, lots of rain, uh, that means that the, the rivers carry less water. And the glaciers in this moment, they melt. Uh, so they kind of make up for the lack of, of water due to rain. And, and so this is, this is a damping factor. Um, in the future, when we have less glaciers or when basi glacial basins start to be ice-free, we don't have this damping effect. And, and this means that when we have precipitation, we have lots of water. When we have no precipitation, when there's a drought, we have little water. And this, uh, this is something that's certainly of concern for water management. This shows you how this runoff will change. This is a small glacier in, uh, in France. The solid line, the solid black line right here shows you um, how the runoff from this glacier, so the entire melt on the glacier, was in a reference period, 1980 till 2009. You see what you expect in August when it's the hottest, um, all the snow, is, the protective snow is gone, that's when you really get the high melt rates. And now, what happens if things keep going like this, if the glaciers get smaller? Um, of course, this will change. And the red line right here shows you the projections for the year 2070 to 2099. And you see that first of all we have less runoff, the runoff peaks are, are lower. They're projected to be lower by around 10% annually, in the summer perhaps even by almost a third. But what you can also see is the runoff peak occurs earlier in the year. And this is, is easy to understand because the glaciers, when we have a dry hot summer, the glaciers are very useful. They melt. They give us water in the rivers when there's absolutely no precipitation. When the glaciers are gone, then we don't have this effect anymore. This entire area is then how much we will lack, how much water. But this area right here also tells you how much water we will get at a point when before we didn't have as much water. And so the idea is, can we somehow take this water, which we've been able to do without in the history, and 
just make it release to the valleys a little bit later. And the way you would do this is by constructing dams, of course. And it turns out that you cannot mitigate this entire uh, difference, but perhaps around two-thirds of it. And this would uh, require the constructions of half a dozen to a dozen dams, uh, uh, which is obviously something that um, the governments right now are, are seriously considering. Because it's, it's a lot of water that in the later summer will eventually be missing, and we have to do something about it. Uh, I can't imagine any more fulfilling work, honestly. If you're in a place like this, uh, you see nature, you, it's, it's almost a spiritual experience for me. Um, you're, you see how humans are really part of nature. Um, nature is, in the end, it's much more powerful than we as humans are. And um, of course, when you see how much these glaciers have melted in the recent years or decades, um, it's a reminder that we need to take better care of our planet.